thank you for um, this uh, introduction and I'm uh, honored to be invited to give this talk. So yeah, I'm from uh, CMEC, so that's the Future Manufacturing Research Hub on Industrial Crystallization and I am located with my research group at the University of uh, Strathclyde in uh, Glasgow indeed. So I would like to take the opportunity today to talk about the results of the core network. And the core network is a large European uh, network that worked on uh, the crystallization enhanced resolution and deracemization of chiral compounds. So a chiral compound comes in two forms, a left-handed form and a right-handed form. So similar to hands, these enantiomers are each other's mirror image, and while they cannot be superimposed over each other. And many pharmaceutical molecules are chiral. So while one enantiomer might fit in a biological receptor, the other, due to its uh, different 3D configuration, might not fit. So this means that the pharmaceutical activity might vary. So depending on the enantiomer, while one enantiomer has the preferred pharmaceutical action, the other might well have less beneficial interactions. A striking example is, of course, uh, thalidomide in the 1960s, where one enantiomer was effective against morning sickness for pregnant women, but the other caused uh, birth defects. Another example is, for instance, uh, ethambutol, where the S enantiomer is used for tuberculosis treatment, while the R form might cause uh, blindness. <clears throat> Regulatory bodies and pharmaceutical industry realize that uh, enantiopure products are preferred over racemic products. Over the years, many racemic uh, products switched to enantiopure products. And you see that now new chiral pharmaceuticals are predominantly marketed as enantiopure products. Because we need to be able to produce enantiopure pharmaceutical products. <clears throat> and crystallization is uh, optimal to do that. We have a very selective uh, uh, crystal structure if we have uh, enantiopure crystals. So there's, it's very difficult to fit uh, a counter enantiomer in such an uh, enantiopure crystal. So this talk will not so much be on discussing crystal structures, it rather discusses the application of such crystal structures for the purpose of separating a racemic solution to obtain an enantiopure product. So how do we get an enantiopure product with the help of crystallization? We can of course start with chiral compounds uh, and synthesize close to enantiopure solutions and crystallize from that uh, solution. And then we can use achiral compounds uh, and use an asymmetric synthesis to en arrive at enantiopure solutions, which we then can crystallize to get the enantiopure product. But we can also synthesize uh, to get a racemic solution, so an aselective synthesis. And Using other separation technologies like chiral uh, chromatography, you can get to enantiopure solutions, which you can then crystallize out your enantiopure product from. Or you can take the racemic solution and add a chiral resolving agent to arrive at diastereomer resolution. So you then take uh, uh, advantage of the difference in solubility of the the diastereomer salts that, uh, that are formed. But what I'm talking about today is the crystallization enhanced resolution and deracemization. <clears throat> so we have a racemic solution and how do we get the enantiopure product from this um, with a, a simple process, with a simple crystallization process. <clears throat> This was the topic of the core network that's um, funded by the European Union in the Horizon 2020 uh, program. 
And the aim of the uh, core network was to uh, create a core industrial toolbox on continuous resolution and deresimization processes. <clears throat> And I was lucky enough to uh, to be the coordinator of this uh, network. So here you see a list of all um, uh, partners in the project, <clears throat> and you can see the the, the usual suspects on uh, of uh, crystallization research in Europe in there. <clears throat> so it's 16 organizations, seven EU countries, seven industries, and nine academics and 15 PhD students. <clears throat> so that, that is, uh, um, th that is the, the big workforce and they worked very uh, hard to obtain a lot of nice results about uh, uh, deresimization and resolution. So in the presentation, I've underlined the names of the core network PhD students uh, in the references I give. But I cannot discuss all uh, research that is uh, that has happened. Uh, so I would uh, advise you to check out the website of the core network, where you can find links to all publications and other information. So let me first define crystallization enhanced resolution and deresimization a bit more. Crystallization enhanced resolution and deracemization relies on the ability of a, of a racemic solution to crystallize into a stable conglomerate. A conglomerate is a mixture of enantiopure crystals. So this means that the obtained final suspension is a mixture of left and right-handed crystals. So here you see the phase diagram. It is uh, usually presented in this triangular form. So the, all the corners represent pure compounds. So the top corner is, uh, is pure solvent, the left corner is pure uh, R enantiomer, and the right corner is pure S enantiomer. And the further away you are from the corner, the less amount of compound is in the composition that is represented by the point in the triangle. So you have a, a solubility line <clears throat> of the of the R enantiomer and a solubility line of the uh, S enantiomer. And then for racemic uh, solutions, if the concentration is high enough, you have a, a region where you can crystallize both solids. So that's in the triphasic uh, domain uh, here. So if we crystallize uh, there, uh, we get a racemic mixture of enantiopure. Uh, crystals. And this racemic mixture still has an enantiomeric excess of 0%. Um, in order to arrive at a resolution process, we would need to crystallize only one of the enantiomers from the solution. So if we only crystallize the R enantiomer, we would make a suspension of enantiopure crystals. The solid product then would be enantiopure and have an enantiomeric excess of 100%. It's only the preferred enantiomer that is in there and it is not contaminated with the counter enantiomer. So how can we achieve the crystallization of only one enantiomer? We can do that by preferentially crystallizing out the preferred enantiomer. We can create a supersaturated racemic solution for instance, uh, in the point, in the red point, in the phase diagram. And then the supersaturation in that point should not be too high so that we are able to grow crystals while nucleation of crystals is not occurring. So then we can add enantiopure seeds of the preferred enantiomer. And in this case, that would be the R enantiomer seeds. And these enantiopure seeds will grow while we have to make sure that the counter enantiomer does not nucleate. So that is shown uh, here uh, on the right, where, um, where the concentration of the preferred enantiomer in the solution decreases. That's the top figure. Uh, the middle figure 
you see that the preferred enantiomer is preferentially crystallized. You get more mass of uh, that enantiomer. But at some point, uh, the unwanted enantiomer will crystallize out. It is a metastable process. So at some point in time, the unwanted uh, enantiomer uh, will form. So this is a delicate process as it is quite tricky and challenging to prevent the counter enantiomer crystals to nucleate. Another disadvantage of a resolution process, such as preferential crystallization, is that you only have a maximum 50% yield. Eventually, you can only crystallize the preferred enantiomer solute molecules into the preferred enantiomer product crystals. In case of a crystallization enhanced deresomization process, we enable the crystallization of the unwanted enantiomer into the preferred enantiomer product crystals. And we do that by enabling, uh, we enable that by introducing a solute resomization into the solution. So if we exploit the process parameters well, then we can transform the unwanted enantiomer into the preferred enantiomer in the solution and then crystallize them and arrive at a yield that is twice that of the resolution process. So let's look at the suspension of a mixture of left and right handed crystals while a solute resomization occurs in the solution. The free energy of such a suspension can be decreased by decreasing the total surface area. So decreasing the total surface energy in the system. So actually this occurs through uh, Oswald ripening so that large crystals grow at the expense of small crystals which dissolve. The actual equilibrium state would be the state with the smallest total surface energy. And that is a single enantiopure crystal in the solution. So it, it might seem counterintuitive, but Oswald ripening will result in a full deresomization in a suspension in the presence of a solute resomization. However, Oswald ripening is a very slow process. It might take millions of years to arrive at an enantiopure solid product. So we have to speed that up. Uh, and we have a number of ways to do that. And one way is uh, introduced by uh, Crystal Ball Vietnam. It's perhaps the, the most known deresomization technique now. Crystal Ball Vietnam found that if you vigorously stir a suspension while resomizing the solute, you arrive at an enantiopure suspension. And the, the group of Elias Vlieg in Nijmegen was able to apply this to a pharmaceutical-like compound. So nowadays, such Vietnam ripening processes obtain enantiopure products often well within the experimental time of one day. Another way to speed up the process is to use temperature cycles. This was found in a collaboration between Adian Flood's group and Girard Coquerel's group. So by increasing and decreasing the temperature, the suspension is partially dissolved and subsequently reground. During such a temperature cycle, the enantiomeric excess is increased. And you do several temperature cycles to, uh, to get to enantiomeric excess, to uh, enantiopurity. So here you see the work of the, the Core Network PhD student Francesca Brevigieri from uh, the ETH. So in 11 temperature cycles, an enantiopure crystalline product is obtained when starting with a slight enantiomeric excess in the initial suspension. In general, this process seems to be a bit faster than Vietnam ripening, possibly due to the larger supersaturations generated in temperature cycling induced deresomization. One of the important factors in this process is indeed the resomization rate. The resomization should be fast enough to allow any enantiomeric excess in the solution to be alleviated so that crystallization of the unwanted enantiomer remains unlikely throughout the process. 
um, it is still not completely clear exactly what causes this uh, process to work. It has been shown that secondary nucleation is needed, but perhaps depending on the system, it could also be caused by agglomeration or growth rate dispersion. Another, another way to speed up the process is by doing a preferential crystallization in the presence of solute resonization. This is also referred to with the complicated term second order asymmetric transformation. Similar to preferential crystallization, enantiopure pure seeds are added and these grow out. However, in this case, the process is more stable than a preferential crystallization. The resumization gets rid of any excess of the S solute that is created by the removal of the R solute through crystallization. So therefore, there is a lower supersaturation for S to nucleate. Thus, the process is more stable than a preferential crystallization in absence of a solute resumization. The core network PhD student Ryusai Okitani showed that his that this process results in a high enantiomeric excess with a good yield and large productivities if designed well. <clears throat> so I have shown now a number of methods to go from a racemic solution to an enantiopure product. But that does not mean that it is possible to apply these methods on all chiral compounds. We need a suspension of stable conglomerate crystals in which simultaneously solute racemization occurs. So we actually need a racemization reaction and a conglomerate system, but we also need racemization and conglomerate conditions to be compatible to each other in the deracemization process. So these are the three prerequisites for a deracemization process. So what we tried to do in the core network is to enlarge the application areas for crystallization enhanced deracemization through these three routes. So we tried to find more solute racemization techniques we tried to enlarge the available conglomerate systems, and we tried to resolve non-overlapping process windows. So about uh, racemization, historically, organic chemists were perhaps not interested uh, to find ways of racemization. They would have been scientifically more interested perhaps in finding selectivity, selective synthesis routes to enantiopure compounds. So there is still a lot to, this, to be discovered uh, in this region of racemization. So we are in need of more racemization routes. One of the routes that was developed within the core network is a photo racemization. This is developed by the PhD students Giuseppe Belletti and Carola Tortora. You need to excite the chiral compound in solution uh, in order for it to be deprotonated by a base. And this creates then an IK a chiral intermediate that can transform back into a left or right-handed molecule. The graph in the middle shows that racemization occurs in an enantiopure solution. You need both UV light and the base in order to for racemization to work. And then the right graph shows that this solute racemization can be used in a Vietna ripening process in order to deracemize de the compound. A second prerequisite is to have a conglomerate system available. And conglomerates only crystallize in about 10% of the cases. In about 90% of the cases, you form a racemic compound. A racemic compound is a crystal in which is a crystal phase in which the enantiomers are 
present in equal amounts. So if you pick one crystal, both enantiomers are in there. So if a racemic compound rather than an enantiopure compound crystallizes from a racemic solution, deracemization cannot be applied. We will have to change the, the conglomerate system into a racemic compound system. We could do that by forming a co-crystal or a solvate or a salt. And once we then have uh, a conglomerate co-crystal, for instance, we can deracemize that using, uh, using that solid phase. Now you can get directions for which coke former to use uh, to form co-crystals from the, the BACG CCDC webinar in September. There the core network PhD student Jan Joris de Vogelaar presented his new method on predicting potential co-formers. Uh, once you selected a co-former, you can use a method developed by uh, Wei Wei Li to screen whether this chiral co-crystal exists. And you get thermodynamic data that allows you to determine whether it's a conglomerate co-crystal or not. Here we see in black the experimental saturation temperatures of ibuprofene in solution. So it's uh, the, the total concentration of ibuprofene is constant, but we vary the solution from enantiopure on the right and the left of the graph to racemic in the middle. The bump in the middle tells you that ibuprofene crystallizes as a racemic compound from racemic solutions. But then if we add the co-former BPE in the solution, a more stable crystalline form is created, having higher saturation temperatures, which you can see at the uh, which you can see from the red points. So the co-crystal of ibuprofene and BPE forms a conglomerate co-crystal system in the solvent heptane. And that in principle then can be used uh, in a resolution or a deracemization process. So that conglomerate co-crystal formation is a viable route, as shown by the core network PhD student Lina Harfush. Uh, she worked on the racemic compound proxifilin, and she found seven co-formers that successfully crystallized uh, proxifilin as a co-crystal. And only one conglomerate uh, uh, system was formed. And this conglomerate is a co-crystal hydrate Proxifilin and salicylic acid. And uh, Lina Harfush also showed that preferential crystallization of this enantiopure uh, co crystal works. So, something similar we wanted to do with the core network model compound Quasi Quantel. This compound was kindly provided by the European pharmaceutical company Merck. Uh, Praziquantel is used in the treatment of the third world disease caused by parasitic flatworms. <clears throat> uh, it is administered as a racemate, so the pharmaceutical uh, drug contains both enantiomers, but only the R Praziquantel is active. You need very high doses to, to have it active in the body. And uh, there is a, quite a bitter taste of s So the, um, So if we would be successful in uh, resolution or deracemization, it uh, would reduce the dose by 50% and get rid of the bitter taste. And especially, uh, when administering this to children, that would be a, a benefit. So how to deracemize praziquantel? Praziquantel is a racemic compound and it's uh, actually quite a stable 
racemic compound compared to its uh, conglomerate um, system. So it, it is difficult to find a co-crystal conglomerate. And uh, we looked into a, a different route where we tried to find derivatives of quasi quantel And we hope that the derivatives of quasi quantel will be a conglomerate system which we can deracinize. So we can start at the precursor of quasi um, quantel and this can be transformed into many derivatives and hopefully one of these derivatives is a conglomerate system that allows us to uh, do a crystallization enhanced deracinization so that we get the enhanced pure derivative which we can translate back selectivity selectively into the enhanced pure uh, precursor, which then can be used to make a non-secure Razi Quantel. So we have to find a conglomerate uh, system of a derivative of Razi Quantel. Uh, the PhD student uh, Giulio, Giulio Valenti tested 30 derivatives. Uh, derivat derivatives. Um, and several of the crystallized derivatives gave some indications for conglomerate formation. However, only one of them uh, showed to be an actual conglomerate system. So here, the chance of forming a conglomerate system was about 1 in 30, so much less than 10%. However, Giulio Valenti succeeded in finding a conglomerate system. So the, the door is open towards a deracinization process of Razi Quantel. So we have a conglomerate system. And it is also possible to racemize uh, Razi Quantel. However, this is under rather harsh temperature conditions. So which makes it impossible to have the conglomerate system and the racemization under the same conditions. So we just have to find a way, a workaround to fulfill the third prerequisite of overlapping process conditions. So Giulio did this by, um, uh, by decoupling the crystallization and the racemization process. So there is a crystallization unit where the in which is crystallized. And then we have a, a racemization unit in which the racemization occurs at higher temperatures. And there is a recycle between these units where a solution is pumped into the, uh, into the racemization unit to racemize the, the Prasiquantel derivative. And that is uh, also pumped back into the crystallization unit. And then in the crystallization unit, uh, temperature cycling induced crystallization is used to arrive at a non pure uh, derivative of quasi quantel. So that's uh, shown on the right in the graph where you see that uh, at the end of uh, after 10 cycles, roughly uh, a non pure derivative is present. So, Prasiquantel can be deracemized using a decoupled crystallization and solute racemization process. So, then I want to uh, very shortly uh, look at uh, uh, industrial applications as a last topic. Um, I do see a strong role for continuous processing in this area. I envisage uh, a continuous deracemization process with a continuous feed of rac racemic compounds, crystals, and a product flow of enantiopure crystals. This means that the racemic compound enters the process uh, should be metastable. So then there is a drive to form the conglomerate, uh, uh, stable conglomerate system. And a solvent mediated phase transformation can then take place to form the, the stable uh, conglomerate salt. 
And then in the presence of a solute racemization, we then have the opportunity to transform all unwanted enantiomer into preferred enantiomer and crystallize out the preferred product. The enantiopurity of the product crystals is controlled then by the suspension content at the start. So actually the, the compound NCPA uh, can be racemized and forms a metastable racemic compound upon synthesis. A schematic of the phase diagram shows that the form two behaves as a conglomerate and the racemic compound is metastable. <clears throat> so then we can actually add the racemic compound to a suspension of stable form two crystals. And with the, the racemization, this racemic compound should, uh, should transfer in the stable form two crystals. And if the stable form two crystals are enantiopure from the start, we would only grow out these enantiopure systems resulting in a deracemization process. We can actually measure that uh, with uh, a Raman spectroscopy because we can measure how much uh, racemic compound is present uh, in respect to uh, to to the um, stable form two. So here you see in the graph the the, the fraction of um, uh, stable form two as a function of time uh, and also the fraction of the other uh, other crystalline forms. And then we feed periodically the racemic compound in the suspension. Um, and this racemic compound is then transformed completely into form two crystals. So now we have to check whether these form two crystals are enantiopure. And that can not be done online, but that can be done um, uh, with the chiral HPLC. So here, on the right, we have a graph of the enantiomeric excess in the solid as a function of time. And we can determine the enantiomeric excess by assuming that we don't nucleate the counter enantiomer of uh, form two. So um, <clears throat> um, that we can determine from the uh, from the uh, from the Raman data. And then we can determine the actual enantiopurity from uh, uh, chiral HPLC. And they, they overlap uh, the points. So that is an indication that we uh, can produce enantiopure uh, solids in this process. Um, good. So this fat batch uh, process seems uh, beneficial compared to batch. And uh, it's a say a first step towards a continuous process uh, where we also remove continuously the the enhanced pure product. Good. So first steps have been made towards a continuous deresonization process. So that leaves me to thank uh, all the PhD students that uh, did the actual work in the core network and also. I'd like to thank all the participants in the in the network and I also would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much Jop. Um, do enter your questions in the chat box everybody um, and Eleanor will be uh, fielding those for you. Yeah is there any question for, for you? This was really, really nice overview of the work that has been done by the core network. Um, thank you very much. That was really interesting, Jo. Thank you. Okay, there's a question from me, Ben. How do you determine the temperature for the cycling? So how do you decide the upper and lower temperature? Um, that's... Uh... That's a good uh, question. So you have to um, you have to um, dissolve, uh, say, a fraction of 
of your crystalline material in the suspension during such a temperature cycle. And say the amount uh, that should be dissolved uh, should should not be too small because then it, it uh, there is hardly any enantiomeric uh, excess gain during a temperature cycle. But at the same time, you should not dissolve um, uh, too, too much. So you should not dissolve everything, uh, for instance, because then it becomes more, uh, say, a, a, a crystallization process and perhaps um, it is more difficult uh, to control. So what we are, uh, I, I think what we are working with is uh, that we, that we um, uh, dissolve, say, a fraction of about five to 20% of the suspension. Do you always use the same delta T for the whole process or it, does it change over the batch? Yeah, it also depends on uh, how much the solubility uh, is a function of temperature, of course. If you have a low solubility, yeah, you, 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 have a, you cannot change the solubility too much. So then you are yeah. bound to uh, a relatively small amount that you can dissolve. Okay, there's another question. If you can please go back to slide 36 and comment um, if one can reach an anti-purity in the bad batch process, does it reach does it reach 100% an anti-purity or instead above 90%? Um. With um, Raman spectroscopy, it's, it's difficult to to get an uh, an accurate uh, a value of um, say how much of a small amount of a uh, uh, small fraction of solid is uh, is present. Uh, but with uh, HPLC, uh, which you have to use uh, offline, uh, you can get uh, more accurate uh, data, and you see that. Uh, it, so the, the HPLC data is a little bit more closer to 100%. So I think the, the enantiomeric uh, excess in, uh, in the solids uh, in this process are really close to uh, 100% once all the enantiomeric component uh, has been transformed. Okay. Um, then Amish is asking, how easy is it to integrate crystal structure prediction, for example, for fine and stable conformer into the discovery or design or of a good system for DRSMization? Well, it, it would be excellent to have um, a crystal structure prediction method that can uh, predict whether you form a conglomerate for a particular compound or a conglomerate mm -hmm. when you use a particular uh, conformer. But I, I don't think the, the crystal structure predictions are uh, that accurate uh, yet. It, uh, it, is, it, it would be uh, really helpful uh, to have uh, that. And perhaps uh, this, say this, this research, research can help. Eh? We, we, we do a lot of trial and error um, and, uh, and more sophisticated methods to, to find uh, co-crystal conglomerates, but uh, say, we have lots of uh, information on various structures that are racemic and, uh, and conglomerate. So that, that seems to should be uh, a very valuable for crystal structure prediction. Uh, I, was, I was wondering uh, from an industrial point of view, because if you want to form a core crystal, you start adding stuff basically and maybe compromise your purity. Like, is that something that you consider? Is, is it a problem? When, uh, like, yeah, of course, um, uh, you have to either make a co-crystal which, which has uh, benign co-formers so that you can use that in the drug, or you mm -hmm. have to, uh, after the deracinization, you have to separate the co-crystal material in its uh, pharmaceutical compound and, in the, and the co-former. Say, for instance, the example I gave uh, of the, the hydrate, uh, co-crystal conglomerate, um, that is relatively easy to separate if you just dissolve it um, in a, uh, so once you have de it, you can dissolve yeah. the, 
the material um, or transform the material in a non-hydrate uh, um, solvent, so a non-aqueous uh, solvent. So then you you get relatively easily uh, your pharmaceutical uh, compounds. Okay, um, Srila, she's is asking. Oh God, it's gone. Um, how was the conglomerate formation detected? Uh, what analysis do you use for this? Uh, what what often was used in the in the core network is uh, second harmonics generation. It's a it's a very simple uh, techniques uh, technique using uh, uh, lasers, which mm -hmm. gives a a, a, a signal. Uh, which indicates that you might have a conglomerate system. So it's a, it's a very nice uh, screening procedure where you make a suspension and quickly uh, screen, quickly use um, second harmonics uh, generation to, to to check whether you have a signal. And if there is a signal, then you can yeah work uh, further, say, go single crystals and determine the structure, for instance, to really check whether it's a conglomerate system. Okay, and um, how easy is the determination of a racemic compound versus the non-pure seeds using the the Raman? I think with these exact slides that you're showing, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's fairly standard uh, nowadays to to it's, it's similar to 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 recognizing different polymorphs in a Raman mm -hmm. uh, spectrum. So a racemic compound and a, and an enantiomer pure compound have different uh, crystal structures, so so they will put, have different uh, Raman uh, spectra. Of course, depending on the the compounds, the the, the differences can be large or uh, quite subtle. What was the solvent you were using here with the Raman probe? Uh, Uh, I am actually not not sure. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I was just that's just like curiosity. Yeah, so the the solvent is abbreviated to uh, MECN. Meth. What was it again? Yeah. Okay, so some some organic solvent. Solvent. Yeah. It's acetonitrile, I think. Yeah. Okay. Was that's it true. like? Did you have problems using um, acetonitrile with the Raman? Because you can get quite strong signal with organic solvent. But maybe uh, you had yeah. so much solid that it was still fine. No, well, we had a substantial amount of solid, so, yeah. so I, I don't recall that we had problems uh, with that. Okay. Any more questions for, for you? No, maybe not. I just have maybe like a quick question. I was wondering um, how how close are we to to kind of develop population balance model for for this system that can help us op basically optimize a process in a optimize the batch process, for example, or even like the condition for continuous crystallization. By knowing exactly the the kinetics of of the different um, processes, how how close are we to that? Because it that that it looks like it, we don't know exactly what's happening for some of these uh, yeah. processes. For some of these processes, we don't really know uh, what's happening, and then process model is indeed one way of uh, testing the different uh, mechanisms to 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 make it likely uh, whether some particular mechanisms occur or not. So that is um, work that uh, is done by uh, the PhD student uh, Brigitte Bodak in, uh, at the ETH in, uh, in yeah. Zurich. So uh, a number of uh, papers on, uh, on process modeling of, uh, for instance, uh, temperature cycling induced uh, euracemization uh, uh, were the result of that. Okay. Well, I'll check Bridget's work then. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Um, so I don't know if there's any more question, otherwise I'll end over to Sophie so she can introduce the next speaker. Yeah, thank you everyone for your questions and thanks Eleanor for, for handling those and thank you Yop most importantly for a fantastic presentation.